computer and share screen on desktop two for right now. Okay, great. So there we are. Um, and um, um, so one of the things, uh, and this is not a serious way to help do a, a, a development, uh, but uh, there's an element of seriousness to this. I really love XKCD. Uh, they really capture uh, a technical mindset in a lot of ways and a lot of time. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're uh, talking in this comic about uh, what the appropriate alcohol level is for coding. Uh, and uh, it, it's often not zero. Uh, kind of like when you uh, are playing pool, uh, they did these studies about uh, uh, the optimum uh, alcohol content for playing pool is about a beer, that when you have no uh, alcohol in you, you uh, tighten up and uh, have one, you relax. More than that, you start missing and going sloppy. Uh, uh, kind of thing uh, might be true with uh, uh, coding as well. Uh, um, and so the funny thing about this is Windows ME is uh, you just regularly lambasted as the worst Microsoft operating system in the world. Uh, and I think they were all drunk. I actually knew a lot of people on that team, so they very well may have been. So there are a few things that I want to talk about uh, as to how to get in the right mindset for uh, a, a development. Uh, there's a, a great book by Robert Persig uh, called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Uh, it's uh, kind of a cult classic. It uh, is an old one, uh, but uh, is talking about uh, the importance of mindset to working on motorcycles. Uh, and uh, uh, he's a, a, a technical writer uh, in the, uh, in the book. Uh, and uh, has this great quote from a uh, assembly uh, a manual for a Japanese barbecue. Uh, and the first line is, uh, assembly of uh, Japanese barbecue required great peace of mind. Uh, and uh, it, it's kind of true that that's the first thing that will enable you to be successful as a uh, developer, uh, is inculcating this mindset uh, of uh, uh, just relax, look at it, the answer will come nibbling at from the back at some point and uh, make itself known. Uh, and this feeling of stuckness uh, is actually kind of something to be treasured uh, in that uh, when you're stuck, uh, uh, you're one little nibble of information away from learning something new. Uh, and that's kind of the exciting part about uh, software development is that there's always something new to, uh, you know, to get stuck on and learn about. Uh, once I know a technology well enough that I can just kind of rattle it out, uh, it, it just becomes boring. And uh, so uh, that steep side of the learning curve uh, is uh, really an exciting place to be on a technology. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's frustrating. Yeah, at times I feel like uh, I'm never going to get this. I'm not, just not smart enough to uh, get to do this. Uh, um, but uh, it, it always, you get that nibble of uh, information back there and it cracks and it works and it feels great to actually crack that nut. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, just be comfortable with it. And it's this idea of uh, comfort with discomfort. Uh, I, yeah, so uh, I've got some anxiety issues at times in my life. I've had bad anxiety issues and went to a, uh, a therapist for a while on a group therapy session. Uh, they uh, really drilled in on this idea of uh, we'll get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you uh, start to feel your heart racing and start to feel that panic come up, uh, sit with it. Uh, just breathe. Uh, and uh, this th same idea works across all sorts of things in life. Uh, uh, yeah, not just anxiety, but when you hit a hard problem, uh, just, just breathe and it will crack eventually. Uh, and uh, so uh, yeah, just something to kind of think of, that this is hard stuff. Uh, and uh, I give it time to bubble up in the right way yeah, to think about it, to really sit with that discomfort and get comfortable uh, uh, with that level of discomfort in, uh, in doing it. And things will crack eventually. You will eventually uh, start to hit some insights on how to uh, do stuff. Uh, then you hit the other problem, of course, uh, which is this idea of imposter syndrome. And uh, most of y'all probably aren't there yet, but I really am at a lot of times, uh, that when I pick up a new piece of technology, uh, I, I feel like, uh, oh, I'm just pulling the wool over somebody's eyes. They're paying me to do this, and I'm sitting here stuck and can't do a darn thing. Uh, and uh, it just feels like I'm an imposter. Uh, uh, but this hits everybody, even the most excellent developers in the world. Uh, some of the folks I worked with at Microsoft were uh, truly legendary developers. I mean, uh, uh, they could do things that I still can't dream of. Uh, and uh, uh, even they would sit there and talk about imposter syndrome and how they uh, picked up a new piece of technology and just felt useless. Uh, and uh, it's really something that uh, everybody goes through. Uh, so sit with discomfort. Uh, when you feel useless, uh, you're not. You're just learning. Uh, uh, and, uh, and really just relax and, uh, and take things uh, calmly. Uh, and it will all, uh, all work. One of the things that uh, is uh, important uh, about this, though, uh, is that um, development takes an intense amount of concentration. Um, I, uh, I, I am probably an, an outlier on this, but I am incredibly distractible when I'm developing. Uh, and uh, so I hate to be interrupted when I'm developing. I can't have music on in the room. I can't uh, I have a dog barking outside. Uh, my uh, 
uh, a boyfriend actually made me a, a curtain tent around my workstation because uh, <laughs> we're in a two bedroom apartment. Uh, and uh, so I, I was getting so grumpy at getting interrupted when I was working on the code for my thesis uh, that uh, I, I quite literally came home one day and there were curtain rods around my desk with curtains to be pulled. Uh, and uh, he uh, said, well, great, here are your curtains. Uh, when the curtains are pulled, I will not interrupt you. I won't even tug on the curtains. I'll send you email because I know you look at email only periodically when you're coding and only when you can be interrupted. Uh, and so that was our stick when uh, I was uh, just uh, in the depths of coding for my thesis. I was... Uh, uh, he would send me email saying, can I interrupt you about what we're having for supper now? Uh, and it might be an hour later that I would answer his email and say, yes, I can be interrupted now. Sorry. Um, but, but interruptions are death to good programming. Uh, that, uh, what uh, you're doing in here uh, is uh, only holding a few things in mind. Uh, you're holding uh, a small set of commands. You're holding a little bit about uh, UI, a little bit what you want to do. Uh, uh, but the uh, more you progress as a developer, uh, the more pieces you'll hold in mind uh, and the more uh, depth of this stack that you're working on, uh, you'll be able to hold in mind. Uh, and really working on this level of concentration and this level of uh, being able to hold, uh, hold, hold on to things as you're working on them uh, is the key to being a good, effective uh, yeah, software developer. Uh, and uh, so uh, on the thesis, I was working with a lot of mathematical concepts uh, and uh, I had to not only hold the uh, syntax of a language and the UI of the language uh, and the data I was working with, uh, I, I, but all the equations that I was working with and make them all kind of tie together. Uh, and so as you layer more and more stacks on there, uh, the more an interruption costs you. Uh, and it would be a half hour or an hour sometimes to get back to that state of uh, having everything in the right place and being able to work on it when I get interrupted. Uh, and uh, it really is uh, finding your quiet place and being able to concentrate uh, is, uh, is really, really key. A number of things about how to get less frustrated, uh, because it is very, very frustrating. Uh, a lot of, uh, I talk about the fun of solving one of these problems, uh, but uh, I, I, before the fun, there's pain. Uh, I, and uh, it's uh, a, a struggle to get there sometimes. Uh, I, I was a competitive wrestler uh, when I was in university, uh, and uh, I, 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 there was a saying there, uh, hate wrestling, love to have wrestled. Uh, and uh, uh, the pain of doing any sport or any intellectual activity uh, is really significant. Uh, and uh, You've got to uh, just kind of work through that uh, that pain, but uh, frustration is particularly painful uh, because you start to feel like you'll never get this uh, and start to feel like uh, I, I, it's just not going to crack for you. Uh, and uh, so when that happens, uh, there are a number of things to do. Uh, I, I walk away is one of them. Uh, and uh, so uh, take breaks. Uh, I talk about not wanting to be interrupted when I'm coding. Uh, that's when it's going well and when I'm actually getting things working. Uh, if I'm sitting there at the uh, computer and just not figuring a new API out or just not figuring out how to do something, uh, it, it's time to get up and walk away for a little while. Uh, I've actually built a walking desk in my uh, office at home, uh, and uh, so I walk on a treadmill. Uh, and uh, just the act of moving and being uh, you know, moving around, I can't do it when I'm coding. Uh, when I'm actually uh, hardcore working on uh, on some algorithm, that's too much distraction for me. Uh, um, but when I'm reading documentation, when I'm working on designs, when I'm uh, reading blogs about how somebody else uh, solves similar problems, uh, I'm walking and moving around to try and get some of that done. And just the very act of being uh, physically engaged uh, uh, tends to bring down some of that uh, frustration level uh, for me. Um, when you're working hard on a problem, uh, it's really the mental model of that problem you should be working on. Uh, I see a lot of y'all when you come to me with uh, with problems, uh, uh, you're just kind of trying variations of things and uh, little syntax tweaks and uh, you'll try uh, yeah, the same thing eight times and then change it a little bit and try it six more uh, and nothing's more uh, yeah, frustrating than that uh, because you're shooting blindly in the dark. Uh, when I'm working on something that uh, I'm just not getting the syntax, I get the same error over and over regardless of how I try it. Uh, I, yeah, this is when I realize, okay, my mental model is wrong. Uh, I don't understand something that's going on under here. Uh, and that's when it's time to uh, first go read conceptual help topics. Uh, if you're trying to figure out how uh, Git merge works, this is one of the elements in tonight's homework. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't start with the manual page for Git merge. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, the man page for Git merge is probably the easiest thing to find. Uh, but if I first look at blog posts of how does merging work in Git, uh, uh, and you hear somebody's conceptual description of what's going on. Uh, this is often a lot easier to kind of get your teeth into and uh, get some meaning extracted from uh, uh, than is looking at the syntax of the command and trying to infer from that syntax what's actually working under the covers. I see this with some of y'all, even with uh, things like directory structures and folders and the uh, files and file extensions. Uh, 
and they're really just kind of the basic concepts of what you're uh, you're working with on here uh, that are uh, in some cases not a fully uh, fleshed out mental model of what's going on and that makes all the syntax way way harder to learn uh, and so if you're having extreme problems with syntax uh, uh, take a step back from syntax uh, and uh, read some conceptual things about uh, uh, how the computer's organized, how the hard drive's organized, how directories work, uh, or if it's actually a JavaScript syntax, uh, you know, what the commands are doing. Uh, and uh, what I do in uh, learning a new language on a lot of this stuff uh, is that uh, I uh, often read code. Uh, so uh, if I uh, have somebody's project that I find that is even remotely similar to what I want to do, uh, I start reading through their code. Uh, and if I find a, a command that I don't know what it is, then I look up that command and then I look how they were using that syntax. Uh, and it's kind of like reading a book as you're uh, learning how to, uh, you know, to write fiction, uh, uh, that reading other people's work helps you figure out how to put concepts together and how to do it uh, you know, logistically and how the syntax works. Uh, and it's always easier to uh, work backwards from a finished work uh, to understanding what's happening uh, than it is from a blank slate and trying to put your own syntax together. Um, but it's really the same idea of going from conceptual back down to the uh, to the specific on uh, on this stuff. So one of the ways that I like getting conceptual topics uh, together in here is by watching other people do things. Uh, I say read code. Uh, you actually have to get to a level of fluency with code before reading code can help. Uh, um, but one of the things in the last few years that has uh, come up more and more is. Uh, this idea of live coding. Uh, and the neat thing about live coding, uh, it, it's uh, a phenomenon that's on Twitch TV and uh, this uh, 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 live EDU, uh, even YouTube has some of this uh, in the uh, streaming sections. I was streaming hangouts with people coding. Uh, and uh, I've tried this and I don't actually find it helps my coding that much to have a live stream going on me when I'm coding. Uh, I can do it, but it's not, uh, I, I don't find it, uh, uh, energizing in the way that some people do uh, in here. Uh, uh, but those people who are really dedicated live coders talk about uh, how it actually helps to have an audience, to have people watching their code and in the chat window saying, uh, why are you doing it this way? That's interesting. And have this dialogue with people. Uh, and it might be an introversion, extroversion thing to some extent. I'm very much an introvert. When I have to get stuff done, uh, I close the doors and, uh, and just kind of do it. Uh, I don't really thrive and energize off uh, a lot of this dialogue, certainly when I'm in a deep uh, intellectual topic like coding. Uh, uh, but some people really do, and having other eyes on uh, yeah, yeah, code, uh, we'll talk about pair programming later today, uh, which is kind of a one-on-one -on -one way of doing the, uh, yeah, the same thing. Uh, um, but as a uh, user, as a viewer of these live coding sessions, uh, it's really quite neat as a way of learning how uh, new pieces of software, new uh, programming languages work. Uh, and that the person who's live coding is generally not sitting there uh, totally mum watching a, a, a screen just typing uh, and you watching them type their code. Uh, uh, they're usually talking to themselves about it. And uh, so uh, I, I, here I'm using a, a, an, an ES6 promise, uh, doing that because it's easier than stringing together uh, the uh, previous form. Or uh, uh, now I'm using async await because promises were too cumbersome. They talk a little bit about what they're doing. Uh, and in hearing somebody who's experienced with a, a, a certain way of coding uh, talk about how they're doing it as they're doing it, uh, you kind of get a shortcut to their mental model of why they're using the functions they are and why they're using the constructs they are and why they're doing it that way. Um, so I find live coding really interesting to watch. Uh, uh, not for hours usually. I mean, I'll usually drop in and out on a session and kind of see where they've gotten to and listen to a little bit and read back the chat history. Uh, and I usually do that as I'm getting into a new development area rather than uh, it uh, remaining interesting after a long period of time. Uh, but there are some uh, live coding streams that are really uh, actually even long-term engaging. There's a, a guy uh, who's, uh, I think, onto his uh, couple thousand live coding session. Uh, uh, with the game Handmade Hero, which the video game has been uh, developing from scratch for years now. And uh, he's got a uh, following of thousands uh, that just sit and watch him code and uh, treat it as uh, uh, better than the uh, latest TV show. Um, uh, it's, it's really kind of a neat phenomena. Just to uh, uh, describe a little bit more what uh, this actually looks like. Uh, oops, I can't do it on that screen. Of course, I'm recording, so my computer is extravagantly slow. So when you are on YouTube and you're looking at them and talk and so you have to do something that well, no, specifically live coding is when somebody just has a stream going uh, and uh, uh, yeah, they're uh, live on the stream, just like we are on the Zoom session, but they're just coding and doing their, uh, their work. Uh, 
a lot of time on YouTube, uh, it's uh, somebody that has actually recorded a, an instructional video, uh, and uh, uh, they recorded it specifically to try and teach. Uh, and this is something different than live coding. Uh, this is uh, uh, it's kind of online classes. I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, uh, the live coding uh, uh, things, though, uh, yeah, so uh, I guess nobody is actually live at the moment on here. I wonder why. Um, I guess it just is evening and... Uh, Actually, maybe my uh, connection is slow enough. It not, doesn't seem to be updating. That it's not it, it's not seeing that I can do the uh, the live ones right now. But anyways, um, I, they're really just uh, and this is on live edu uh, dot, uh, TV. Twitch TV uh, is a uh, very similar one in a lot of ways. Uh, um, and I think because I'm recording, my computer is too slow to do anything useful with this uh, yeah, right now. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, they're quite literally people sitting down coding, uh, and uh, there's a chat session that usually goes with it. Uh, and uh, uh, depending on where they are on their project, uh, uh, yeah, neat things very often pop up to uh, to watch and, uh, and learn from them. One of the downsides I find of the uh, live coding as compared to classes, though, uh, is that you have to go in real time. Uh, and I almost never watch video content in real time. Uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, additions to YouTube in the last couple of years is that uh, a speed up button that lets you go to 1.5 times or two times. Uh, and it actually doesn't sound like the chipmunks these days because they do some audio modulation to make it still sound in normal ranges. Uh, um, but you really can go so much faster uh, and just kind of skim through it until you get to the point that's interesting uh, that you want to uh, slow down to normal speed and listen to it again. Uh, um, and uh, that saves just a lot of time to be able to scan through things more quickly. And I've already talked beyond where I am with the live coding. so. Uh, that doesn't come up, that's not the, uh, oh, okay. It keeps telling me it's going to get ready to. Yeah, I'm not sure I believe it anymore. Okay, go away. Um, so you talked about live coding versus classes. Uh, and uh, the uh, next thing that uh, I uh, do uh, a lot of uh, is watch online classes. Uh, uh, Pluralsight is probably my favorite uh, source for online courses right now. Uh, I also use Safari Books, uh, Stan Winston School, Adobe Cloud, uh, I, and uh, then I've got a few authors of uh, courseware that, uh, uh, man, they just can't publish anything that I don't buy yeah, because they're so good and it's so uh, yeah, such a, a, a sharp way of presenting information. Uh, and it does get expensive, uh, but uh, for me, this is my profession. And so uh, if I'm spending uh, a, a thousand bucks a year on uh, online courseware, uh, it, it's just a cost of business to try and keep up with things. Uh, and uh, yeah, with the individual courses, they're fairly cheap. Uh, with Pluralsight, uh, it's 300 bucks a year. And so you kind of have to make sure you're going to use it before you, uh, you do that. Uh, um, but there are so many courses on there. Um, what did that forward? Yeah. They are, and I've got a couple of those in here that I'll, uh, that I'll talk about. I don't tend to use Treehouse, but I uh, have looked at Code Academy courses and Code School uh, and uh, some like that. Uh, I put those in a uh, slightly different category than I do uh, a, a plural site, uh, uh, yeah, just because uh, they uh, often have uh, an online lab associated with them and a cohort that you move through with, uh, and uh, depending on the uh, course where it's a different model. That's right, exactly. So, so they're a little bit more expensive and a little bit more uh, directed learning. Uh, than, uh, the thing that I really like about Pluralsight uh, is that uh, it's got such a breadth of offerings there uh, that if I want to pick up a new area, um, I can probably find something on there. Uh, and and uh, well, Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are new uh, packages and platforms coming out all the time. Uh, and uh, uh, Pluralsight uh, has uh, just been uh, a, a vacuum in sucking up other little learning companies recently. Uh, and so one that I was a member of for a long time uh, was called Digital Tutors, and they focused on uh, uh, graphics software. Uh, so uh, things like Autodesk 3D Studio, 3D Max, uh, um, uh, 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 Maya, um, uh, uh, AutoCAD, uh, all the uh, things for uh, developing graphics packages. Uh, and uh, they got sucked up by Pluralsight. Uh, and that's actually when I decided to join Pluralsight is when the stuff I was already subscribing to uh, is under a bigger umbrella. And uh, so it's really kind of working out for them that way. Yeah, but uh, because they've been sucking up all the small specialized companies, uh, they've got all these niches that they uh, fill very, very thoroughly. And uh, even for uh, core coding stuff, uh, they're uh, still really my, uh, my favorite one. 
they're about 300 bucks a year, uh, but uh, they've got some student deals uh, and uh, they have sales that go on a few times a year that bring it down a little bit less than that. I think I ended up paying 250 this last year, uh, but uh, I ended up with a $200 deal the year before that and stuff. So uh, I do keep watching them uh, and uh, it's, uh, I, I, we'll watch a little bit of one here uh, later today, I think, uh, just to uh, get an idea as we start talking about build environments. Safari Books is in a uh, different category for me. Uh, I uh, don't use this one nearly as much. Uh, uh, it's also about 300 bucks a year. They also have some sales on there. Uh, but uh, uh, what I like about Safari Books is that uh, they have a bunch of different publishers on there. Pact Publishing is a big one. Uh, uh, O'Reilly is, of course, one of the biggest uh, yeah, technical press uh, yeah, books. Uh, um, but instead of just being the things that are already released, which I go ahead and uh, buy uh, individually sometimes when I want them anyways, uh, uh, just so I can actually have the PDF and put it on my mobile devices and stuff. Uh, uh, they have early release books, uh, which means that, uh, uh, for instance, when I was learning to uh, do React programming a couple years ago, uh, um, uh, yeah, they uh, had the uh, first React uh, textbook uh, uh, that was uh, not releasing until I think it was early 2016, and this was late uh, mid 2015. Uh, so it was still six or eight months away from release. Uh, uh, but because we have this early access program, I was able to uh, look at it and look at the chapters that were already written, uh, uh, yeah, look at the forum where the author is talking about uh, uh, the chapters to the people that are uh, in this early access program. Uh, and it was really kind of a step up on uh, some structured learning materials in a very, very new framework. Uh, and so I find the early release program, particularly when I'm kind of on the bleeding edge of a technology, uh, worth it in its own right to uh, subscribe to Safari Books. They do have some videos, uh, they do have some uh, a, a, a benefit from having already released material out there, but it's really that early release program that's the, uh, the favorite thing about Safari Books for me. So one that uh, might uh, help uh, some of you all, uh, and this is more after this course is uh, done than it is right now. Uh, when I've been getting with you on uh, Zoom sessions uh, and working on uh, specific topics, uh, it's been an interaction kind of like Hack Hands is. Uh, so Hack Hands is actually something that was also bought by Pluralsight, but it's a very different model and a different description than Pluralsight is. Uh, what Hack Hands is, uh, is uh, a uh, site that has a uh, video screen sharing uh, a, a piece of software with it uh, and a bunch of registered experts. Uh, and the experts uh, I put a, a down their bill rate. Uh, and so if you've been working with React for years now and are totally kind of top class world uh, class uh, uh, React programmer, uh, you might be asking 60 or 70 bucks an hour to uh, uh, it helps somebody with that. Some cases more than that. Uh, uh, if you're, uh, you know, just kind of a little bit beyond where I was when I was learning, you've taken a React class, you've built a few sample apps, uh, and you know the basics there, uh, uh, you might be asking 15 uh, uh, bucks an hour. Uh, and so you kind of define when you put your problem up there, you write down, hey, here's what I want to solve. Uh, 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 here's where I am. Uh, here's the uh, type of person I would like to get help from. Uh, and here's my budget. Uh, and uh, then the experts that are on there uh, get this uh, pretty much in real time. If they're logged into the Hackhands platform, uh, uh, they'll see that right away. And it's usually within five or uh, five or ten minutes. Uh, if you leave Hackhands open, that somebody will come back and uh, uh, and say, yeah, "Hey, can I help you with this?" Uh, uh, yeah, okay, share your screen now. Uh, let me look at what you're doing. Uh, oh, let me share my screen. Uh, uh, here's how I'd solve it. Uh, and you have this one-on-one -on -one discussion with them, uh, and they can give you code snippets and things like that. Uh, and uh, uh, when you hit your budget, your session ends, uh, or if they uh, solve your problem before that, uh, they go, well, okay, thanks, uh, here you go, and you sign off and you're done. Uh, it's a way of getting uh, this kind of impromptu help uh, in a uh, very low friction way on your programming problems. And uh, in a new area, again, it can uh, really be worth it to pay some money to somebody who's uh, familiar in that area to look at what you're stuck on right now. Um, again, right now, don't worry about it too much. Uh, feel free to keep using me for that, and uh, we'll do Zoom sessions and work through, you know, through some of the problems in the class. Uh, uh, but I presume most of you at some point are going to be working on programming problems outside this class again someday. Yeah. And uh, it's a, a good way for other frameworks that uh, you happen to run into. I'm sorry? I won't know what you're working on because I won't know all the new frameworks. <laughs> That's my excuse. <laughs> So there's a fellow in Hamilton, uh, uh, West Bose, uh, who's one of these people uh, that I was talking about that I'll buy any instructional material he comes out with. Uh, he was writing React courses when I first uh, signed up for him, uh, and uh, I really kind of fell in love with the way that he presents material and um, the way that he does these courses. Uh, he's got an ES6 course, that's the main reason why I uh, yeah, mentioned him in here. Uh, we're talking about JavaScript in here in a fairly basic way, and I'm uh, uh, talking about a mixture of uh, yeah, mostly ES5 and uh, uh, some little tidbits from ES6 float their way into the class now and then. Uh, 
uh, but it's really not an ES6 course that we're talking about in here. Uh, uh, ES6 is the latest version of JavaScript, uh, and uh, uh, for most of the things we're doing, it doesn't matter too much, but as soon as we start dealing with asynchronous code, uh, they've got new constructs like async await uh, that make that a whole lot easier. Uh, they've got new ways of writing compact code, uh, uh, yeah, more optimized versions of code. Uh, and as you start to kind of get into the uh, the latest JavaScript, uh, it uh, really uh, is uh, is important to kind of start from uh, a, a, from a clean slate and kind of relearn how to uh, do a bunch of this uh, yeah, this stuff. And uh, uh, Wes's ES6 course is just uh, is just wonderful. Uh, um, he's coming out with a yeah, another one on it. Take away uh, yeah, specifically yeah, here next month, uh, and I'm sure I'll buy it as well. Uh, um, but uh, depending on what area you're working in, uh, there is undoubtedly somebody who has made a name for themselves as being the go-to expert in that area. And uh, they may or may not be on something like Pluralsight, they may be on their own site. Uh, and so westboss.com uh, is, uh, is Wes's site, uh, and really kind of just ran across him by reading the forums and finding his way to his site. Uh, and he's actually much more able to uh, make a living for himself doing this stuff on his own site because he's become the de facto expert. Uh, than he would be if he were a plural site author, uh, yeah, yeah, just getting uh, whatever cuts left over after they took their slice. Uh, and so I don't at all mind uh, paying my uh, 80 or 100 bucks for uh, each of these uh, uh, courses as they come out uh, uh, to get kind of the most distilled expert view of how to, uh, how to learn this new stuff. And depending on what it is that you're learning, uh, find somebody like that in that area to help, uh, uh, help cover those gaps. Uh, it's a variant of JavaScript. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, ES uh, stands for ECMAScript, uh, and this is the uh, W3C. Yeah, so W3C is the standards bodies for the uh, the World Wide Web, uh, and uh, it's the W3C standard for uh, JavaScript. Uh, and uh, so right now we're mostly uh, working with uh, ES5 or ES2015 are two names for the same thing. Uh, um, and uh, there are some ways of using ES6. Uh, we'll talk about later today, actually, a, a, a transpiler called Babel. And uh, Babel allows you to use ES6 constructs on today's browsers. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, for the most part, uh, if you want things to just work natively in the browser, you're stuck with uh, ES2015 currently. Uh, and ES6 is kind of uh, the next revision of browsers down the uh, road when it's fully accepted as a standard. Uh, and so uh, if uh, you uh, have problems that are solved in ES6, or even ES7 is being talked about now, uh, uh, when you transpile things in Babel uh, to an older version of the language, you uh, uh, give it with flags, how kind of how far out on the bleeding edge you want to be. Uh, um, and uh, these new language constructs can solve problems that have been around for a long time, but at the cost of needing to be uh, uh, translated into what the current browsers can actually run. Um, so here I've got a couple of slides for uh, Code School, Code Academy. You mentioned uh, uh, yeah, Lena. Um, these are a little bit uh, different uh, than uh, the uh, uh, courses, uh, just because they put more structure around your learning. Uh, and so Code School, for instance, uh, is the one I'm more familiar with. Uh, uh, it uh, has a, a series of quizzes at the end of each section, uh, and uh, uh, some programming challenges, uh, and a group of students that you're moving together in a cohort with. Uh, and uh, until you actually solve those properly, uh, uh, you can't move along to the uh, to the next lesson. So uh, it really is a structured way of learning uh, code as compared to a, a seat yourself. Yep. Yeah, yeah, good. I, I, I like this style of learning for some things when I uh, am uh, starting with something that uh, is, uh, is really very new to me and I'm feeling very lost, that degree of structure uh, helps. Uh, I find that as I've gotten more experience that uh, I, uh, I, I can't actually put up with the slowness of some of these pieces. Uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I should in some cases, because when it's a very new language, I tend to jump ahead and uh, uh, and some of the fundamentals get lost. Uh, for instance, Elixir uh, um, is a uh, really neat functional programming language, uh, and uh, I kind of did this with Elixir of uh, uh, yeah, jumping into it and writing some uh, sample applications and not quite realizing how different it was. Uh, uh, because some of the terms feel similar to what I'm using in most of my other languages. Uh, and if I'd gone through a very structured course like this, uh, I probably would have been forced to slow down to understand those differences more fully. Uh, so it can be a good thing, uh, but uh, I, I'm unfortunately a very impatient person. Uh, and uh, so uh, I would much rather, uh, yeah, for my style of learning, uh, uh, learn a few basics and then get stuck horribly on something and realize what an idiot I was and that I was wrong and then have to go back to the start rather than starting that way from the scratch. 
Code Academy, like, it does. I, I've looked at it, but I haven't actually taken anything through Code Academy. Yeah. Wait, how do I get back to my slides? There, I get back to my slides. So now we're going to talk about a couple of sites that uh, are, are really good for asking specific questions of. Uh, and um, uh, depending on what the question is, I go to a, a different site. Uh, uh, we haven't actually, and I realized that I didn't even put it in the slides, uh, how to ask a good uh, Google question, uh, because there is kind of an art to uh, uh, writing uh, queries to Google to get answers for programming problems. Uh, uh, so maybe we'll kind of freeform talk about that a little bit. Uh, but there are a couple of sites specifically uh, for uh, technical topics that uh, are very good in their, uh, their own right. Uh, Aquora is one of them. Uh, I'm not a, a, a huge fan of Quora because it does kind of get off on tangents and there's some questionable answers and stuff in there and they don't uh, kind of uh, uh, have a voting system on answers that works very well. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about conceptual topics, uh, how does this programming language apply to this problem or uh, how do people use this type of uh, a, a technology to uh, apply to this area of uh, a society? Uh, uh, these kind of problems, you get really interesting answers out of Quora. And Quora has the uh, nice ability to allow you to follow uh, individual people on there. Uh, so once you uh, uh, do find someone that really does give good answers, you follow them, uh, and then you just see their answers pop up in your feed whenever you uh, you want something. And if they're working on something similar to you, it's often very useful. But, so Quora is one site to be aware of. Uh, uh, the one that I use much more than Quora is Stack Overflow. Uh, and uh, so uh, this is really kind of the primary place to uh, go ask code questions. Uh, and uh, the answers you'll get to those code questions are of incredibly variable quality. Uh, uh, some people will answer with just crap answers on there, right? and if you put them into your code, well, it's uh, caveat emptor, uh, uh, just kind of uh, 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 the answers are worth what you pay for them. Uh, but other times there are absolute gems in there. Uh, and I found it very common, even in professional coding situations, uh, to have people quite literally just copy paste a, uh, a piece of Stack Overflow code into the code they're working with uh, and leave a comment in the code saying that it was from this topic on Stack Overflow. Uh, and that comment back is absolutely critical because if you then have a bug you're tracking down, uh, probably somebody else has copied that same bit of code and replied back to the thread saying this was wrong, uh, I fixed it this way. And so you can go back there and save yourself hours by uh, having the backlink work for you. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really seem to be uh, a, a stigma at all uh, in a professional coding situation uh, uh, to use Stack Overflow uh, as long as you do leave that backlink to uh, make the traces in case there's a problem with it. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a broad question. Uh, in, in general, of course, yeah, there's a lot of copyright on, uh, on code. Uh, uh, that uh, if you're uh, dealing with a uh, project on GitHub, there's always a license associated with it. Uh, if uh, you're uh, 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 publishing something in that uh, sort of code format, uh, it, it, it's uh, just critical that uh, you have rights to everything to publish before you uh, sell it professionally. Uh, there's actually a uh, professional risk policy uh, for software developers that uh, is. Uh, uh, not inexpensive uh, in that a lot of the contracts when you're doing contract software development work uh, uh, require that you stipulate that you have rights to all of your code. And uh, if the company gets sued somewhere down the road uh, and a piece of code that you uh, gave to them, uh, uh, they're going to come after you to uh, settle that copyright claim. Now, uh, for the most part, uh, a yes, Stack Overflow, uh, when you uh, agree to the terms of service of Stack Overflow, uh, though, uh, you're waiving your rights to the, uh, the, uh, the code that you're posting up there. Uh, uh, there are some situations where you'd want to be a little bit careful with that. Uh, if somebody has uh, answered a question uh, saying, uh, you know, here at Microsoft, we've done it this way and copied a whole block of code in there, uh, uh, yeah, then Microsoft actually still owns the rights to that code. There could be a sticky situation. Uh, um, but uh, for the most part, you're okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, if you're lifting an answer from code, uh, Stack Overflow into your code, uh, keeping that backlink in your code, uh, and uh, a problem comes up and somebody says, oh, that uh, code wasn't, uh, wasn't clean, well, you're right to write something else to replace it, and that backlink is there, so you know where it came from. So I want to talk now a little bit about working as a group. Uh, we've talked about how to get answers out on the web, uh, and uh, I, I, I didn't really talk uh, a lot about the uh, way of structuring Google questions. Uh, but before I actually, uh, let me say a couple words on that before I go to this, uh, in that uh, I, when, I'm, when I'm writing a question to Google, when I'm trying to uh, find search terms on something, uh, I, I make absolutely certain that uh, if I'm asking for a command help, uh, that command is in there in the search term. Uh, 
Um, if I'm getting uh, other uh, uh, things popping up that uh, are related, uh, I make heavy use of uh, the, uh, uh, the search modifiers in uh, Google. Uh, so you can say, uh, uh, yeah, look for, uh, uh, for async await, uh, but uh, uh, not uh, uh, traffic. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so the minus traffic uh, and pull out terms. Uh, uh, and uh, that way, if uh, await was a, a specific term in a uh, traffic management discipline, you're getting all these traffic management hits that were absolutely useless to you. You could get anything that had the term traffic in it to uh, just disappear from your search results. Uh, so by using both the uh, specific technical vocabulary uh, and exclusions for things that are popping up and getting your, in your way in search results, uh, you can actually get fairly targeted on the, uh, the way that you're getting those hits. Uh, the other thing that I make sure that I uh, do is that I am logged into uh, Google, uh, and uh, uh, this is important because when we were talking about search engine optimization, uh, a big part of the hits that Google gives me are about actually based on my previous search history. Uh, and because I've been doing a lot of VR coding, I've been doing a lot of React coding, uh, uh, yeah, those are actually biased terms in my search results, and so things that uh, are uh, the terms that I'm searching for with those also in it uh, will tend to bubble up to the top of my personal list. Uh, so uh, select your terms carefully, uh, you, you do exclusion terms for things that are getting in the way, uh, and make sure you're logged in so your history of search results uh, tends to bias more in, uh, in your favor on it. Uh, I've also found that longer search queries beat shorter search queries. Uh, and uh, I, so if I want to uh, see uh, how a piece of code works uh, and I've got an example from someone else, I will actually snip that whole line and paste it in sometimes, uh, uh, or uh, I'll uh, do a few variant words related to it. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that I find search result queries on uh, uh, five or six word strings uh, to be much, much better and more usable than one or two word uh, uh, queries that are in there, um, just because their model is able to more accurately filter on things with that. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, yeah, good queries are an art form and being able to uh, have, a, have good Google foo uh, in uh, doing programming queries uh, is uh, something to really work on and, uh, and develop and pay attention to. So I want to move on from external sources of uh, help to uh, internal sources of, uh, of help. Uh, um, working as a group uh, is, uh, is challenging, and there's a lot of different kinds of challenges, uh, particularly uh, when uh, most of the folks in your uh, group are uh, really at a fairly uh, beginner level on, uh, on things. Uh, and uh, uh, GitHub itself uh, is uh, a, a source of frustration at times. Uh, um, I find it uh, in an experienced team uh, that uh, it's really a valuable tool, uh, but uh, one of the sources of frustration with an inexperienced team is just how you use it. Uh, and I've very carefully not stipulated how you use GitHub uh, for uh, doing group collaboration in here, uh, uh, because different groups are, uh, are different on it. Uh, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the different ways that I've used it and how I've made some of those, uh, yeah, those decisions. Uh, um, internal, informal mechanisms really work best for small groups on short projects. And I really do see this as a, a small group short project in this class. Uh, um, even those uh, yeah, teams that have four or five people on them in here, uh, it's still a small group and a short project in the way that it's set up. Uh, and uh, so I wouldn't necessarily go to a uh, very formal mechanism for doing merge requests and uh, a continuous integration testing and uh, all the pieces that uh, make GitHub a really valuable tool for my large group longer term project. So, but you should know that these things are there because at some point you'll hopefully work on a bigger project that uh, needs this type of uh, control. So I'm just fine for this class. I uh, talked about wanting you guys to have for project two and uh, then moving forward also for project three uh, to have a uh, GitHub repo with all of your code in it. Uh, and uh, I talked uh, even a little bit about how this is uh, good for tracking contributors and seeing if uh, everybody's contributing to the code equally. Uh, at some basic level, I don't care if the GitHub history shows this. So. Uh, and uh, as you're working on this, if you uh, end up being so informal on this stuff that you have one person that manages the repo and you send them email snippets and they check them in, uh, well, that's just okay. As long as you uh, are satisfied in your group that everybody is contributing equally uh, and uh, that uh, you're uh, doing something, uh, yeah, I don't actually know why only your screen turned off. Um, and, and that everybody is, uh, it, 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 it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> huh. Oh, there we go. Yeah, just just don't look at it, and it'll work fine. <laughs> right. So at some level, I don't care if uh, you guys are are following a uh, formalized process and having contributors and uh, tracking those contributors in there. Uh, I'm not actually going to use that as part of the uh, grading criteria for this. Uh, 
Um, if you guys, as you're turning in your projects, say, uh, uh, yeah, we all contributed equally, uh, but person X was the one that handled the uh, repo management, uh, I, I'll, I'll just shrug and go okay on it. Uh, so, so don't be hampered by GitHub uh, in doing your uh, group communication. Uh, use it only as a helpful tool. That, yeah. Uh, there are, um, but uh, you may not have to know about them. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, by, as part of this week's homework, I've actually asked people to look into Git merge. Uh, and some folks in this uh, last one tend to do a merge. So, two people work on the same uh, a file, but at the same time, and check it back in, and there's a conflict. Uh, you'll often have to do a merge and resolve that conflict. Uh, and uh, so, so, that's one that you might have to uh, look at. Uh, but depend, depending on the strategy you pick for using it, uh, if you have one person uh, resolving all that before we check code in, uh, then you'll never have to do a merge. Uh, so, uh, the ones that you listed are the basics. Uh, and uh, if you use nothing else except for that, you'll get by the course, you're fine. Uh, uh, but there's a lot more that you can do. Uh, I can a little bit, yeah. Um, I uh, am not going to go into great depth on it today, uh, primarily because uh, figuring it out is part of the homework. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in talking about the source of information, uh, this week's homework is actually not coding homework. Uh, uh, it's a uh, written answer homework, uh, so you can go use some of these sources of information. Uh, and since Git merge is one of them, I think I'm not going to go into great depth. But next week, I'll have you do that to do something. So I want to talk about uh, several strategies for using Git on larger teams so you understand uh, what some of the more formalized methods of uh, Git use uh, are. Uh, so you can adapt whatever portion of those are useful to the uh, project that you're on. Uh, when I'm running a uh, big public uh, uh, project on Git, uh, this is something that uh, uh, it does not have a fixed team where anybody could be uh, wanting to contribute pieces to it uh, and uh, fork it for their own use and say, hey, this fork I did this useful, uh, contribute it back. Uh, um, I usually use a uh, strategy uh, where uh, I, as the GitHub uh, uh, repo owner, uh, am the only one who can check in. And uh, if I don't give contributor permissions to anybody else, uh, the only way they can actually make changes to that repo uh, is uh, by forking it. And then on that fork, uh, they develop on that fork. Uh, and then they uh, contribute a uh, merge request back to me. Uh, and all the code that they've changed comes back to me on that merge request. I look at it. Uh, I decide, oh, I want to keep this piece. This doesn't really make sense. This is extraneous. I'd do this a little bit differently. Uh, and I manually edit that back in my code. Uh, and then I check it back into the, uh, yeah, the branch. Uh, and uh, that means that as the uh, owner of the repo, uh, I'm basically the single uh, uh, funnel uh, through which everything goes into the, uh, uh, the project. Uh, and that, I'm sorry? Uh, well, is that try to merge it back that uh, is the, uh, yeah, the key. Uh, if you do a fork, you have no obligation to ever merge it back. Uh, you can go off on totally different development paths and it's just a different project, essentially. Uh, uh, in this model, this public project model, uh, if you both uh, uh, tried to merge it back, you do it by a merge request, uh, and I get your merge request and look at your code, uh, and uh, uh, then I get John's merge request and look at John's code and go, oh, this is for your code, but this works better in this situation. Uh, uh, let me mumble those together and do something totally different that takes ideas of both and puts it back in. So, so I'd manually do that. Uh, and so this is really good when you've got a, a large publicly used project uh, that uh, uh, someone has ownership of uh, that they want to uh, make sure the quality of the code and it's uh, staying uh, in this uh, uh, consistent style uh, that is consistently useful for, uh, for people. Uh, but it does mean that the owner of the project is that single point of failure, okay? And so often on projects that uh, run in this style, uh, you can make a reverse request and not hear back for months and months because you're just swamped behind things and uh, uh, sometimes you never hear back. So it has a disadvantage too. Oh, um, so you were talking about the code and Well, so possibly, yeah. Uh, um, I, I use a fork to get the initial uh, cut of the code from somebody else's project, but after that, I use branches a lot. Um, and so, uh, branches are not a fork; uh, they are a uh, another code path within a fork. Uh, and when you're actually making a merge request, uh, you're making a merge request for a branch in a fork. Uh, 
And uh, so uh, I might have uh, a, a three or four different branches where I was just playing. Uh, and I put all this other crap in there that uh, it actually doesn't do any good. Uh, and then I make my uh, merge upstream uh, a, a branch uh, and just carry those pieces that I really want to show to the maintainer of that project. Uh, and then I'll do a merge request off that branch. You know, everything you change in the branch, you make a merge request on a branch rather than on a fork. Um, but uh, you have to fork for it to become your own project, uh, um, but then you can make as many branches on that fork as you want. And when you do the upstream merge request, it's just for a single branch. But it's everything within that branch. And uh, so this is actually uh, something to, uh, I, when I was first starting with GitHub, I made some embarrassing uh, mistakes that way, thinking I was making a merge request and saying, uh, take this piece of code, when it was actually everything in that branch, and they'd see all the crap that I was playing with as well. Uh, and uh, I, I'd go, well, why are you giving me all this? So that's why I go to start with a clean branch on it. So another uh, way, uh, and this is actually a model that I follow much more commonly uh, than I do the public project model, uh, is to uh, still have a project owner, uh, but uh, to have a project owner uh, with contributors on that same project. Uh, uh, because the process of making a fork of your own uh, is a little bit cumbersome, and then you've got uh, your own repo there, uh, uh, and uh, in a project that is totally open source uh, that anybody can see, uh, it doesn't matter that you do that. Uh, but a lot of the projects I'm working with are actually closed source. Uh, and so I don't want somebody uh, making what's essentially a private copy of the uh, whole repository and then working off that private copy. Uh, I instead want to, uh, just from a data security perspective, uh, make sure that everybody is using the same project, uh, that when somebody leaves the company, uh, I can turn off their permissions and know they don't have that code anymore. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, yeah, this is just a better way of doing it than, uh, yeah, than a fork and doing it in their own, uh, yeah, their own location. But I still want to be the one that uh, is uh, the uh, maintainer of that project. Uh, and here's where I use branches uh, a, a lot. Um, the way I'll usually set up my uh, GitHub uh, is so that the master branch uh, is uh, uh, the only uh, uh, branch that uh, uh, actually is built from. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm going to introduce a couple terms here uh, that uh, are uh, probably new ones to you. Uh, um, I uh, really like using a continuous integration uh, approach to uh, code development. Uh, what I mean by this is that uh, when the master branch is updated, uh, this automatically fires a trigger uh, that uh, will uh, uh, build that master branch, that will deploy that master branch to a test server, that will run tests on that test server, and if all those tests pass, We'll deploy it on up to the uh, the main server, and uh, so what this is is uh, a, a degree of automation to your build and test process. That means that when uh, people are uh, working on the project, uh, they just check in. That comes to me as a merge request. I merge that into the master branch if I think it's a good merge, uh, and then all the rest of the acceptance tests happen automatically, and it pushes up to the main server automatically, and I don't have to do any of that stuff manually. And it's just a much more efficient way of uh, making sure that you follow good test discipline and that your build process is very, very repeatable. Um, because at any time that something changes in that master branch, uh, everything's going to get automatically kicked off of, uh, of that. So that's continuous integration. Uh, and uh, it's not worth doing uh, on a uh, project like we're doing in this class, uh, uh, just because you might build uh, a half a dozen times uh, and then you're done with the uh, project in the class. Uh, but uh, if I'm working on a two-year project and we've got uh, half a dozen contributors coming in out of the project, uh, I don't want every time somebody uh, checks a little thing in to have to manually log onto the server and uh, build and pull and uh, I, I, I do my tests. And uh, I, it's just time that uh, is better spent doing something else. And so uh, automation uh, serves a yeah, good purpose there. The other thing that uh, having a uh, solid master branch does uh, is means that uh, when I, uh, I, I say you're working on a project with me uh, and I assign a feature to you, uh, I'm going to name the branch that you're working on. Uh, uh, let's say uh, on my mapping project, uh, I uh, had a, uh, a, a Zoom uh, a feature on the, uh, the map. Uh, I call that branch feature slash Zoom. Uh, and uh, I, so you'd work on the feature slash Zoom branch. Uh, you'd make all your changes there. Uh, uh, when you're done, uh, you do a merge request uh, with all your good comments in there. I look at your code uh, and I merge uh, feature Zoom into the, uh, uh, the mainline branch. Uh, um, if uh, I don't realize as I'm doing my tests on that, uh, that uh, I, 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 zooming out doesn't work, but zooming in works, uh, then I'm going to assign to you a bug. 
and uh, you'll uh, you, you start a branch that might be called uh, bug slash zoom fix or uh, yeah, bug slash zoom out. Uh, and you'll do your bug fix in that branch and then uh, merge request that back to me. Uh, and I'll see that that bug fix works from my acceptance test and then I'll integrate that into the master branch. Um, what it means is that the master branch is never broken. And this is something that uh, on uh, small projects, uh, again, doesn't matter all that much, but on big projects uh, is uh, just critical. Uh, uh, there was actually at Microsoft a, a, a dunce cap, a, a giant pylon uh, with asshole written on it uh, that I had to wear a couple times because uh, I broke the build. Uh, and uh, breaking the build when you're on a project with hundreds or thousands of people is a really, really bad thing because it wastes hours and hours of people's time uh, to uh, uh, pull down a version of the build uh, that, uh, it, it, that, that isn't working and could never work. Uh, and so uh, you really want to uh, have a process in place that makes it very, very difficult to break the build. Uh, uh, GitHub wasn't around at that point, and so I could actually check in code that broke the build. Uh, uh, now that you have this idea of uh, a product owner in control of a master branch, uh, it's much harder to break the build. You don't have to wear the dunce cap anymore. Uh, um, this was actually a kind of aggressive way of doing that anyway. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> right. Uh. So yeah, uh, a master branch is a, uh, a really good strategy uh, if uh, you have uh, someone that's going to be in control of the project, but uh, you want to uh, run a team around that project. Um, the way that I'm suggesting that most of you guys work in this class is actually using a co-contributor strategy. Okay? And uh, this is one where uh, you don't have one person that is the owner of the, uh, of the project. It may be on their uh, repo, uh, um, uh, yeah, but uh, that's just kind of organizational. Like it has to be on somebody's repo. Uh, but that you actually add the co-contributors to that repo, uh, and uh, then anybody can check in code. Uh, and probably anybody can check in code to any branch. Uh, you could decide you want a co-contributor strategy, but you still want some branch management discipline and so that you protect the master branch. Uh, and then somebody has to accept a merge request to update the master branch, but it can be anybody on the team. Uh, a co-contributor strategy is really best for uh, when you've got a, uh, a team of people equally responsible for the project uh, and you want to have as few organizational barriers in the way of working on that project as possible. But it comes at a cost. And the cost that it comes at uh, is that uh, uh, because you have no uh, strict delineations of responsibility, uh, that you can work on this branch and you can work on this branch, uh, you have to do that informally. And if I've got a, a project that has five files in it uh, and uh, I have uh, three people working on those five files and uh, I, uh, two of us edit three of the five files at once and uh, uh, they get jumbled, uh, then you have to do a merge. And uh, that can get complicated, figure out what version you keep. And uh, it's really kind of the, uh, uh, the last one in that has to do that merge. Uh, that uh, uh, when you pull down the uh, latest code, uh, if you and the uh, uh, if five minutes since you pulled, make your changes and push back and uh, somebody else has pulled in that time and they make their changes uh, uh, and they push back later, uh, well, they're the last one to push back and so they have to do the merge. Uh, the strategy that is most useful uh, is uh, to uh, always pull right before you push. Uh, and uh, so uh, that way on any files that are not uh, uh, edited that you haven't changed, uh, uh, you uh, get away for free and don't have to merge on those. Uh, and any ones that do have a uh, merge, you know before you push what that merge is. Uh, and that way you never have to deal with an unknown uh, with it coming back and putting up this merge dialogue and uh, saying you're in trouble and now you have to merge before you can finish your check-in. And it gives you uh, just more time to think about the problem. So always pull before, right before you push is uh, kind of the discipline in the uh, co-contributor uh, style project. Um, the last one I want to talk about in uh, this section, uh, and then we'll take a few minutes break before uh, we uh, go into the next section of stuff, is uh, the idea of pair programming. Um, I talked when I was uh, talking about hack hands uh, and uh, talking about uh, the live coding, uh, how, how useful it is to actually watch somebody else code. Uh, in the last few years, this has been uh, ensconced in uh, development practices as the idea of pair programming to uh, have more than one person uh, be uh, responsible for a uh, particular feature or a particular bit of coding, uh, and then to do it as a, uh, as a group. Uh, and uh, so one person's always at the keyboard, of course, uh, and uh, in general, that uh, one person should be the less experienced person, uh, uh, just because you uh, get kind of muscle memory and uh, a, 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 a keyboard memory of uh, typing things in that make you faster later. Uh, but the second person is by no means a uh, passive observer to this process. Uh, uh, in pair programming, it's actually the person who is not on the keyboard that has the greater responsibilities in some sense. Uh, 
they're responsible for uh, flagging if you're doing something that uh, is going to introduce bugs uh, for uh, uh, yeah, thinking about better ways of doing something uh, for uh, doing the research on syntax. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so if you don't uh, have the right syntax in there or making a syntax mistake, it's the person who is uh, not doing the typing and the coding that probably has the man page open that can say the syntax of this command is actually this. Uh, and uh, so working as a pair on some of these things uh, means you've got two sets of eyes on problems uh, and uh, two brains to, uh, uh, to do the coding uh, and that you both learn uh, more efficiently as a uh, result on that. So I'm a uh, convert to pair programming. Uh, uh, being the introvert I am and being so distractible and uh, hating being interrupted when I'm coding, uh, I uh, initially was the, of the opinion that, uh, God, this just isn't the way I can work. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and when I'm really in a deep uh, a technical area and thinking about how uh, yeah, the math behind what I'm doing is working and that kind of stuff, I still have a hard time with pair programming. Uh, um, but it's a really valuable technique uh, when I uh, am uh, working on uh, something that is not quite as involved as that. For, uh, professors. Please grab them. Yep. Yeah, so uh, pair programming uh, is, uh, is, is something you should try at some point. Uh, and uh, if only to have uh, a couple people with, uh, with eyes on what, uh, what you're writing at that particular time. Uh, and it does make it easier when you get stuck on something to have somebody else kind of looking over your shoulder to help get unstuck on things. I think from here I uh, go into some more definitions and concepts that I'd like to take a break on before we, uh, we do. So let's take 10 or 15 minutes uh, and uh, a, a get a, a drink and a stretch and uh, then we'll talk about front end versus back end development. Or five or 10 minutes if nobody's actually leaving. <laughs>
So I've been fiddling around with JS fiddle. Yeah, cool. So I found one that sort of works to what I wanted to do. It's not common enough. That's fine. But um, I'm still trying to I'm trying to get this corresponding marker to correspond with these these multi. Okay. Because when I click it, it goes back to the first. Oh, I see. Okay. And I figured I thought I could get away with it by making a copy of this and just renaming the variable into control window two and just replacing the marker with the marker two. Yeah, I would have actually used uh, the, um, the 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 marker object uh, in uh, in here uh, is uh, it has got access to the click position or has access to the uh, the latitude and longitude of the marker uh, from one of the markers. Okay. And, and so, so I would have actually uh, modified it there. I think. Modified it. Mm -hmm. uh, from when you're adding uh, the uh, the listener, uh, you're uh, uh, just opening uh, the uh, the map and marker. Uh, but uh, I, instead of doing that uh, in my uh, third example from last week, uh, I uh, actually had a uh, function that was being called, uh, and that function uh, is uh, where you could go uh, look into the marker, grab the latitude and longitude, uh, and then add that to your info window. If that uh, makes sense. Sort of. I, I would have to. I just need to take a look at the third example. Yeah, yeah. Have a look at the third example yeah. on how that was created in the function. Yeah. 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 Oh, seven. Okay. Okay. So I think I'm maybe just starting over now. I think that's just too much. I think I've screwed it up too much. <laughs> that's a reasonable approach. Um, it really is. I, mean, I think that's probably my best bet at this point. Otherwise, I'm okay. But um, okay. six and I think that's one more. Fantastic. Hey. Uh, I'm having a weird issue with coding um, the question. Okay. I don't know if it's strange, but I have a nested repository or something like that. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know how I've done it, but yeah. whenever I try to, um, okay, so I'll just navigate yeah. into my project to create some text. Yeah. Yeah. So, if I do that, I do a good status for you, please. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you have some things that are not staged, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, uh, if you do a poll now, uh, you're going to uh, only pull things that are not the ones that have uh, modified modified files. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, but that's fine. Um, so, okay. so when you get poll, what's it missing? Let's see. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh, not pulling those three files because you already had changes in them, but that's uh, yeah, but that's fine. Um, and uh, so uh, it uh, says to either stash or uh, commit those uh, three files before you uh, pull. Um, do you know what the state of the uh, server is uh, if uh, other people have modified those three files? Yeah, I imagine they have. Okay. Um, the the thing that I often do with uh, with that then uh, is uh, make a copy of those three files to somewhere. Uh, go uh, get checkout for each of the three files, uh, and that goes back to the original version. And uh, then uh, I look at my copied file by and then you got a new file I've pulled down and manually merge them, and then uh, that changes it and I push it back up. Did that make sense? Do you want to go see how to? It makes sense to me, but this is actually not the issue that I was. Oh, it's not. Okay. Thinking, yeah, I mean, this is. It says kind of this before, but it was. Um, I don't. Uh, Folder that was a part of the DS and the stores, and it was saying that the file that you have on your computer is different from the file that you have on your computer to the like, 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 it. And then I tried to force it, and then it would just say, um, um, perhaps I'll, I'll try to. So one command that is very useful actually wasn't in the uh, 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 the list a minute ago is git checkout. Uh, and what git checkout does is uh, when you do it with a uh, single file. So if I were to say uh, git checkout business HTML, uh, it would uh, just throw away my current changes and pull the version back from the server for just that file and not the right at all. 
And uh, so the reason that's useful is that uh, if you have a, a conflict like that, uh, GS underscore whatever, address, and you get checked out GS underscore whatever, right? It's <laughs> 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 that sounds good. Okay, that's such a good one. But but make sure you make a manual copy of the things you actually want to save to someone else before you take it checked. Totally, yeah. I'm not even sure what they Okay, should we talk about back end and front end stuff? Uh, no. Uh, so, so this was actually something that I intended originally to do, and uh, we spent so much time on presentations on uh, Project One, uh, and we're going to do the presentations for Project Three. Uh, uh, kind of just try to shuffle and maybe uh, and not do presentations for Project Two. You just send it to me. Yeah. And and, and send it to me uh, along with any descriptions that I need to uh, understand it. Uh, and one of three things will happen. Uh, either uh, I'll come, uh, uh, come back and uh, say, yeah, no, I actually was hoping for more here. Uh, this doesn't look quite like, uh, like what I wanted. Uh, or I'll say, yeah, this is great. Uh, 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 when we come to the back end, uh, try hooking up, uh, uh, hooking up these areas. Uh, um, or, or I don't understand. You need to describe more fully uh, yeah, before I can uh, do it. Um, but another way, let's do it offline rather than in front of the class. Okay, so front end versus uh, back end. Uh, there are a few terms uh, in uh, software development about uh, uh, developers that you might see. Uh, you might hear a front end development position or a full stack developer uh, or uh, less frequently a back end developer. Uh, uh, basically, a full stack is just somebody that can uh, move from the front end uh, uh, through server code uh, and everything in between. Uh, and uh, it's uh, something that really, uh, it, only with experience do uh, jump back and forth uh, very fluently. People tend to specialize in the early part of their career. Uh, and so in this class, I'm asking you to do a front-end project and a back-end project, kind of pushing you to be uh, seeing all the sides of the stack. Uh, um, but you're gonna find one that you're more comfortable with and one that is, uh, is easier for you, uh, and that's just fine. Uh, that's to be expected. Uh, um, but uh, front-end programming is basically anything that runs in the user's browser. Uh, so we have only done front-end programming in this class so far. Uh, we've had a web server, but that web server has only delivered code that uh, would go and run in the user's browser uh, and, and as full file. So, um, so uh, yeah, with the possible exception of Google Maps in here, uh, Google Maps does have a server component. Uh, and uh, that server is sitting on Google server, and you didn't have to manage that server. Uh, so you've only used the front-end aspect of uh, Google Maps. But there was a server back there somewhere. Uh, that was doing more than just serving a page uh, of JavaScript one running on the user's machine. Uh, one key element of that that uh, you uh, didn't actually probably realize uh, as you were using the Google Apps, Maps API uh, is that uh, you're using the primary uh, method of communication from a back end to the front end called JSON, or JavaScript object notation. We're going to be talking a lot more about JSON. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the ways of uh, uh, doing project three, having a backend component without having to do a lot of the uh, work on the server is to use other people's uh, services uh, and then interpret the, the JSON in your, uh, uh, your code properly. If you're just using a database, for instance, you need not necessarily uh, run the database on your server. If you uh, have it outputting JSON from somebody else's server, it's still a valid backend project. Um, so JSON is the uh, means of communication between the front end and the back end. Uh, and, uh, uh, we'll talk more uh, next class, or probably mostly the following class, actually, uh, uh, about the specifics of, uh, of JSON. I think next week I'm going to do databases and then talk about JSON after databases. Um, so databases are one of the key things that sit on the server. Right? And uh, 
server-side code uh, is anything that's uh, not running on the client, that's not running in the browser, that happens on your server to make something else work. Uh, uh, and databases are probably the key example of that. Uh, you know, there are very few web applications that don't have a database somewhere in the, uh, the mix. Uh, um, but it's not the only uh, case of that. Uh, services, uh, anything that's doing authentication probably has a back-end component. Uh, anything that's directly talking to the file store on the server uh, has a back-end component. Uh, uh, yeah, anything that's not running in the user's browser is part of the, uh, the back-end, basically. Um, so it is possible to have a web server uh, that uh, doesn't have uh, any backend code, really. Uh, and that's how we've been using the web server uh, to date, uh, is uh, to uh, uh, just have it uh, pull up uh, you know, what uh, you're putting for files to be sent down to the client uh, and not actually do anything more interesting with them. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're going to change from that today. Uh, and, and, and this next version of stuff that I uh, run through, uh, I uh, would like to uh, to ask that you don't get hung up on the uh, uh, the details. Uh, that uh, uh, the reason I'm presenting this stuff uh, uh, this way, uh, and uh, uh, you'll remember uh, class four of last uh, 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 last term, uh, was probably the single worst class I have ever run in my life. Uh, uh, yeah, because what I was trying to do in class four was both introduce the concepts uh, as well as get people to set them up on their machines and do something with it, uh, and uh, I, I, I watched uh, brains lock up all the way around the room and couldn't recover from it, and uh, it, it, it was horrible. And so don't let your brain lock up today. I'm just throwing concepts out here. Uh, you're not going to do anything with these concepts in this week's homework. Uh, and uh, then next week, we'll start talking about this stuff again. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, ask questions about it, dig into details, uh, but, uh, uh, but don't panic. We'll have another presentation before you have to do it. The thing that uh, is... Um, happening on the back end uh, is uh, that you've got a lot of packages coming together. Okay? And uh, we're going to talk about these in a uh, variety of ways. Uh, but uh, the uh, predominant back end server code that we're going to use in here uh, is a uh, package called node.js. Uh, uh, node.js is uh, JavaScript on the server. Okay? Up until very recently, yeah, well, very recently, five or six years ago, uh, uh, it was unheard of to use JavaScript on the server. I right? use languages like Python uh, or uh, C++ or uh, even more recently Elixir and uh, functional languages like Pascal. Uh, but JavaScript on the server was just uh, weird. Nobody would do it. Uh, uh, Node.js was the uh, first example of a uh, server-based JavaScript. Uh, and uh, it's really uh, turned into something that uh, is quite neat. Uh, because you're using the same language on the client and the server, uh, you've got this idea of uh, isomorphic applications. Uh, applications where the uh, code can run on the server or the client. And so for instance, if you're dealing with uh, uh, talking to a phone that has very, very few capabilities, uh, you might have that code run all on the server and all the smarts are on the server and it just sends down graphics to the phone. Uh, if you're talking on a full-fledged PC, uh, uh, where you have local processing resources, a lot of that server-side JS uh, will then come down and run on the client. Uh, and it's the same JavaScript running in both cases uh, in, uh, in that example. Uh, what Node.js allows you to do uh, is beyond uh, this uh, isometric uh, application, uh, it allows you uh, to uh, access server-side resources like the file store, like databases, uh, like JSON structures, uh, authentication dialogues, uh, all using JavaScript, uh, so you only have one language to learn. And this makes it a lot easier for you guys starting out than if I had to teach you Python on the server uh, and JavaScript on the client and you had to hold these concepts together in your head at the same time and not get them confused. So uh, Node.js is uh, a, a, a really uh, an interesting thing we'll dig into a bit here. Uh, NPM stands for Node Package Manager. And this is the other piece of uh, the uh, Node.js ecosystem, right, is that uh, uh, just like in um, JavaScript, where you're cutting out uh, different pieces of functionality from different applications and pasting them together man manually, uh, a Node Package Manager lets you do the same thing, but automatically. Uh, and so if I want to, uh, for instance, use a calendar control, uh, then uh, I'll do uh, a, a NPM, Node Package Manager, install calendar. And uh, that'll pull down the calendar into my server-side code, and then I can just reference it as an object from within my JavaScript. Uh, I don't have to actually uh, uh, look at the code for, uh, for using that object. Uh, I can just reference it uh, and uh, make a call to that function, essentially. Uh, and then everything else happens automatically because I've pulled the package down. 
Uh, from the uh, node package manager. So uh, a, a node package manager is actually a repository, kind of like GitHub, uh, but uh, instead of being a version place where you can check changes back in, uh, it only has release packages that, uh, yeah, that live up there. Um, but they are version. The owner of that package will put new versions up there. Okay? And uh, this is actually uh, a, a security problem with node package manager. There was a uh, uh, a very uh, famous case last fall uh, where uh, the uh, owner of a uh, package called LeftPad uh, had his account uh, 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 compromised uh, and uh, 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 LeftPad uh, was, uh, was deleted. Uh, and uh, I, uh, this was uh, 11 lines of code uh, that uh, made sure that uh, uh, the things you were lining up in the browser uh, all had the same amount of padding. So they lined up straight across the left hand side of the browser. Uh, which is 11 lines of code. Anybody who had wanted to uh, could have just uh, copied and pasted those 11 lines of code uh, and they would have not had a dependency on left pad. Uh, but because it was the 11 lines of code that formed the NPM package left pad that uh, hundreds of thousands of other web pages on the, uh, the network depended upon, uh, when that package disappeared from Node Package Manager, uh, all the builds broke and everybody that tried to incorporate left pad and uh, their build process went down the plane. So, and so one of the problems with a uh, package manager that has little snippets of code uh, packaged so discreetly uh, is that you're kind of at the mercy, uh, the mercy of version updates and, uh, and changes up there. Uh, and consequently, there are now a couple of hardened repositories uh, where uh, uh, you get a, a, a token guaranteeing you that version of that package until you decide to explicitly update it. Uh, and it's always going to be there. And even the owner of that can't remove that package uh, from the repository. Yeah. Primarily because of management and, uh, and, and bug fixes. Uh, that, uh, in the left pad case, it was just the 11 lines of code. Probably copy and paste would have worked just, uh, yeah, just as well. Uh, but uh, if uh, I'm pulling in a calendar component that talks to Google Calendar and talks to Microsoft Exchange and talks to uh, uh, whatever the new uh, fancy Sunrise calendar that just uh, was popular last year, uh, um, I don't want to have to manage all of these interdependencies. Uh, and uh, so if I'm uh, making a reference to somebody else's package and pulling in their code, I get all their bug fixes and functionality enhancements uh, uh, basically for free without my having to, uh, to worry about them. And so there's, yeah, there's trade-offs. Um, you, you have more functionality, but less security and uh, a, a less dependable build process. Um, Webpack uh, is uh, something that uh, yeah, we'll uh, yeah, just kind of touch on very briefly in this course uh, because it's kind of uh, worthy of a course of itself. Uh, uh, it's a bundler. So uh, as we uh, have been using JavaScript so far, uh, we've only been using individual uh, JavaScript files that we explicitly include from our HTML. Uh, and so we haven't had need of a bundler. Uh, where a bundler comes in uh, is that uh, if uh, I've got uh, uh, you get 50 different JavaScript files and, uh, and 30 different CSS files, uh, and they reference 100 different packages underneath that. Uh, I don't want to have to uh, send that whole mess of stuff to the client in one big uh, set of uh, files. Uh, and I don't want my HTML have to, have to individually reference each one of those. So, and so a bundler will take all of these uh, pieces of, uh, of code uh, and group them together into a single file so that one file can, uh, can come down. Now, it actually does a little bit more than that. Uh, Webpack is also a free processor as it bundles. Uh, and so it's able to uh, have some server-side code to run to uh, do intelligent things at build time. Uh, and uh, for instance, it will, uh, it, it's where you run uh, battle from. If you're doing the uh, transpiler to uh, UTF-6 and uh, I go back to older versions of the browser. Uh, um, it's also where uh, if you wanted to obfuscate what you're doing uh, so that none of the people on the client can actually look at your code, uh, you'd run a minimizer or an obfuscator within uh, Webpack. Uh, so all of these are server-side build steps that allow you to uh, very finely control the way that you're uh, running your development environment and then what gets pushed down to the get the client. Um, Express in here uh, is uh, a, a web server that can uh, run uh, through Webpack. Uh, uh, so we're using the Apache web server and it's kind of this fixed installation on the server. Uh, you could have a more controllable web server that was running as part of your project. and. Uh, then your server-side code can actually be changing the web server at runtime, and you can do more interesting client-server applications that way. We're not really going to be touching Express in, uh, in this course. Uh, uh, then React and Angular are uh, front-end libraries, uh, but uh, they're deployed through uh, uh, the build environment. Uh, so uh, depending on what platform you're going down to, uh, if, uh, 
I was using React, I might on a phone be uh, downloading a React Native library. If I was going to a browser uh, on a desktop machine, I'd be uh, uh, loading the, uh, yeah, the React browser libraries. Uh, and so React is kind of this intermediate language that you use front-end concepts, uh, but it depends on the server to push the right version down. Uh, uh, when I was talking about uh, the uh, user screen in a browser, you asked a question uh, about how it detects uh, a couple classes ago. Uh, um, it would actually be uh, your uh, code that was deployed by Webpack. It would uh, it have the uh, server-side string of uh, uh, look at the user string uh, and then push this version of client code down to this version of user string. So all of this is to say that there is a great deal of complication and complexity sitting on the server side that, that allows you to deliver a client side experience in the way that we've been talking about. Uh, and uh, we're going to uh, go through a couple of, uh, of examples of, uh, of this uh, and uh, not get hung up on the details of this today, uh, but uh, uh, we're going to have to, over the uh, next couple of classes, make some decisions as to how we structure a uh, server uh, that allows us to deliver client experiences to our users. Let me go through a uh, little bit uh, of uh, one of uh, Corey House's uh, videos, uh, and uh, uh, he's going to talk about this just a, uh, a little bit more. So uh, Corey House is uh, a Pluralsight author. Uh, he's got some of his stuff up on YouTube. We're not going to watch the longer version today. This is about a half hour, but if you want more depth on the uh, little couple minute piece we watch, uh, uh, go watch that your, uh, yourself. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, show it in uh, this format. Uh, uh, to uh, give you an idea of, uh, of what the uh, plural site uh, courses uh, look like, except I'm still recording and this is going to be painful. I may pause my recording while this plays so it's not quite as painful. Uh, maybe I will, or maybe it's paused itself. Well, there we go.